This video is sponsored by Boxu. More about them later. Hi everyone, I'm Flag on HG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black, with half the Pokedex banned by you, the viewers. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. Welcome to the second Snaplock. Just like last time, I posted a link to a survey on my Discord and on my Twitter where people could vote for up to 10 Pokémon from the Unova Pokédex to ban from my playthrough. Pokémon were then sorted by the number of votes they received, and the top 50% were snapped out of existence. You know, kinda like those little indie movies. Not including Legendaries and Mythicals, there are 69 unique evolution lines in the black and white Unova Pokédex, a number that some people might find funny. Me. I'm, I'm people. So after tallying up the poll results from all 713 people that voted, 37 of those unique evolution lines turned to dust. It ended up being 37 instead of 35 because the 35th most voted for Pokemon was a three-way tie between Simisage, Whimsicott, and Golurk. The most voted for Pokemon by a good margin was Crocodile. Makes sense, that's an incredibly good Pokemon for Nuzlocke. In fact, most of the top voted for Pokemon are pretty unsurprising. The least voted for Pokemon is also unsurprising. It was Behem. I bet people just forgot that Behem was a Pokemon. Anyways, that left me with 32 potential encounters. 32 Pokemon left to avenge the fallen and restore the world. So grab your shields, grab your hammers, grab your mutated green blood stuff, and grab your giant sky beams, because the Unova Snaplock starts right now. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just as a quick reminder, before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Let's see how this goes. Our Unova journey begins by meeting up with my two rivals, Bianca and Charon. The three of us get to choose our starter Pokémon. However, all three of these Pokémon have been turned to dust by a Mad Titan, so it doesn't really matter too much which one I pick. I go with Tepig because it's my favorite of the three. Bianca then goes with Snivy, and Charon goes with Oshawa. Then I have to fight both of them in back-to-back -back rival fights. Cause we're young and we're reckless, we took it way too far, and we end up trashing my bedroom. Fortunately, no one seems to be left with a nasty scar. After that, I get to head to Route 1 and get the first eligible encounter, a Patrat. Of course, I name our first Avenger Cap, and he joins the team. In Accumula City, I dump Tepig into the box. Then Cap and I meet the third, and arguably most significant rival, N. He's droning on about Pokémon liberation and the questionable ethics of forcing living sentient creatures to engage in perilous combat for our own entertainment. Classic kids game storyline stuff. All N has is a purple cat, which Cap knocks out with a few tackles, so it's a pretty unremarkable third rival fight. After that, I get a purple cat of my own from Route 2, and I name her Black Widow. And now it's time for a rematch against Bianca, aka our fourth rival fight. It's pretty easy though, so we can just skip it and move on. Which brings us to our fifth rival fight, a rematch with Charon. I know this isn't a novel observation about these games, but holy sh**, why are there five rival fights before the first freaking gym? And it's not like it really slows down much after that. By the time the credits roll, I will have done 19 different rival fights. 19. That is more rival fights than the Johto games, the Hoenn games, and the Sinnoh games combined. Needless to say, I will not be covering 95% of these rival fights. With the exception of a few fights against N, they are super easy, a total waste of time, and actively detrimental to my enjoyment of these games. But okay, rant over. Finally, time for the first gym badge. Since I picked Tepig, I have to fight Cress. He leads with a Lillipup, and I lead with Black Widow. I start with a Growl to lower Lillipup's attack. He goes for a workup, which offsets the drop though. I then go for a sand attack to lower his accuracy as he goes for another workup. Then I go for a growl. Lillipup gets off a weak bite before he starts going for workup again. 
The idea here is to growl the Lillipup until he stops using Workup, because the AI won't use Workup once his special attack stat has been maxed at plus 6. This lets me get Lillipup down to minus 1 before I start trying to take him out. I'm not totally sure if that was worth it, but whatever. With Lillipup at minus 1, I start going for Assist, which causes Black Widow to randomly use one of Cap's moves. Any move we pull from Cap with Assist, being either Tackle, Bite, or Leer, will be better than just clicking Scratch. I end up getting Leer twice in a row, so after that I pivot to Scratch, which doesn't even do half damage, because Purloin sucks. Another Scratch puts Lillipup in the red as we continue to tank weak bites. Cress uses a potion here, so I go for Assist to pull a Bite, which thanks to Stab is enough to fully knock out Lillipup. I guess this time cats are better than dogs. This gets Black Widow to level 15, where she learns Pursuit, which finally gives her a Stab attack, albeit a pretty weak one. Panpour comes out next and has a special move in Water Gun, so I can't go for the Growl strat. Instead, I go for Sand Attack as Panpour fires off a pretty strong Water Gun. This activates our Orenberry though, so it's safe to stay in for at least one more turn. I go for an Assist and unfortunately pull a weak Tackle. Panpour then gets off a Workup, which is pretty scary. I go for another Assist and manage to pull a Bite, so Panpour falls into the yellow. We then get hit by another Water Gun, which would have definitely killed if it crit, but like, she's a purloin, that really wouldn't have been the end of the world if we got crit there. But since Panpour didn't crit, a Pursuit finishes him off on the next turn, winning us the first gym badge. Apparently cats are also better than monkeys. The first gym badge lets me use Cut outside of battle, so I can head to the Dream Yard. In the rustling grass I can encounter an Audino. I've killed a lot of these things in the past, but I'm not sure if I've ever actually really used one. I name Audino War Machine, and he joins the squad. I also catch a Blitzel from Route 3, who I named Nebula, and a Woobat from Wellspring Cave, who I named Valkyrie. So now we have a team of five, which is pretty good because the second gym leader Lenora can be pretty tricky. Both her normal type Pokemon hit pretty hard for this point in the game. Now I could just get a throw from a shaking grass patch outside of Pinwheel Forest, which would make this gym pretty trivial. But I don't want to do that. I want to save my Pinwheel Forest encounter for inside the forest so that I can get Sawaddle which I can't get access to until after the second gym badge. I know that some people actually separate Pinwheel Forest inside and Pinwheel Forest outside as two locations, but I don't want to do that. My run, my rules. So it's up to our current team of five, though thankfully both Cap and Black Widow have evolved. Lenora leads with a Herp Derp that gets off an Intimidate into Black Widow. I go for a Growl to lower her attack, and then she retaliates with a very nasty takedown. As you can see, I was very clearly dead to another critical hit here. So next I switch to War Machine, who is decently bulky and tanks a takedown. I go for another Growl as I get lucky and dodge the takedown in retaliation. Then I hit a hard secret power before tanking another retaliation. I decide to switch to Cap on the next turn. There's a couple reasons for this. First, War Machine has Regenerator, which recovers his HP when I switch him out, so he's now sitting at full health. Second, Cap is able to finish off the Herp Derp, which brings in Lenora's Watch Hog. Cap knows Detect, which lets him block Lenora's turn 1 Retaliate, which does double damage if it's used the turn immediately after an ally falls. A critical hit Retaliate at double the power likely would have killed War Machine, so this is safer. On the next turn, Watchhog goes for a Leer, and then Cap misses a Hypnosis. I switch to War Machine, who then gets hit by a second Leer. Watchhog then goes for a Retaliate, which does do good damage thanks to the Leer, and I go for an Attract. Lenora's Watchhog then breaks through the infatuation, and she connects with her Hypnosis. Checks out. A held Chestoberry cures the sleep, though. So War Machine hits a secret power. Watchhog then breaks through infatuation again, and hits another Retaliate as we fire back with another secret power. I'm at risk to a crit here, so I switch to Cap, who gets hit by a Retaliate. Then I go back to War Machine, and now you can really see the benefits of Regenerator. Unfortunately, Watchhog does get a critical hit with Retaliate. So on the next turn, I decide to switch to Black Widow because I'd rather risk her to another crit than risk War Machine. But Watchhog just ends up missing a Hypnosis. So then I switch back to War Machine, and unfortunately get put to sleep with another Hypnosis. However, after a few turns, War Machine manages to wake up and finish off the Watchhog with a final secret power before she falls into critical hit range. Not the cleanest win, I'll admit, but a win is a win. That's badge number two. With that, I can head into Pinwheel Forest and catch my beloved Sawaddle. What an absolute cutie. I name her Gamora. And almost instantly, she evolves into Swadloon, who is still pretty adorable. Now instead of this little bug, she kinda looks like an unpeeled potato wrapped in lettuce. Or like a jelly bean. 
or some kind of cream puff. If all this talk of food is making you hungry, then you are going to love this video sponsor, Boxu. Boxu is a monthly subscription service that delivers premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings straight from Japan to your door. Each month, Boxu will send you a themed box that contains a curated gourmet journey through Japan. The first Boxu you'll receive is called Seasons of Japan, which brings you snacks themed around Japan's four seasons. Following Seasons of Japan, each month has a brand new theme. For example, this month's theme is Boxu Tenjubi, celebrating Boxu turning six years old. Each Boxu is beautifully packaged and comes with a cultural booklet that tells you about every snack as well as where in Japan they all come from. At the risk of sounding insincerely hyperbolic, I really think that Boxu is an awesome product. I'm kind of a picky eater, but every snack that I tried was delicious. The mochis from the Seasons of Japan box were probably my favorite. Just look at these little guys. They're dead now, I have no regrets. I also loved pouring through the cultural booklet to read about each snack. It's really clear that there was a lot of thought and care put into making each Boxu package feel unique. Even just opening and looking through all the different snacks was a ton of fun. Poppy was really into it too. So if you want to try some awesome Japanese snacks, have a blast doing it, and support my channel along the way, then you can click the link in the description below and use my code to get $15 off your first Boxu order. Thanks so much to Boxu for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. After Gamora evolves, Valkyrie also warms up a little bit and evolves into Swoobat, which is pretty useful for this upcoming gym. Unfortunately, when training for the gym, I wasn't really paying that close attention to the level cap, and I accidentally overleveled two of my mons. Fortunately, they aren't that essential for this gym. But it does mean that we're heading into battle against Berg with a team of four. He leads with Whirlipede, and I lead with the newly evolved Valkyrie. A Confusion does a huge chunk of damage, and then Whirlipede goes for a Screech, which misses because Screech is a horrendous move. So a second Confusion takes him out. That brings in Dwebble who threatens Valkyrie with a smackdown, so I switch to War Machine. Now buckle up. I go for a Grass Knot as War Machine hits another smackdown. A second Grass Knot brings Dwebble into the yellow as he fires back with a Sand Attack. A third Grass Knot leaves Dwebble in the red as War Machine shrugs off another smackdown. Unfortunately, this means that Berg will heal, so I switch to Black Widow to shake off the accuracy drop. After doing the smallest amount of chip with Fake Out, I switch back to War Machine. Unfortunately, she comes in on a sand attack, but at least she's at full HP thanks to Regenerator. I go for a Grass Knot again, and Dwebble decides to fully commit to using the sand attack strat. So I go for a workup as Dwebble hits a smackdown. I then miss a Grass Knot, and Dwebble hits a critical hit smackdown. But that's fine, because on the next turn, Grass Knot leaves Dwebble with a sliver. Bummer. I guess the Dwebble saga continues. Berg uses another Hyper Potion, and then we hit a Grass Knot. Fun! Even more fun, we miss a Grass Knot on the next turn, and Dwebble gets another critical hit. So now I switch back to Black Widow. Then it's more chip with Fake Out, and then a switch back to War Machine. Regenerator is super useful for this fight. Dwebble then hits a critical hit Strugil Bugil, causing War Machine's special attack to drop. So I switch to Nebula on a Smackdown. Then I just Shockwave the Dwebble and knock him out. In hindsight, I probably made that a lot harder than it had to be, but on the bright side, you got to hear me say Grass Knot and Smackdown like 40 times. Anyways, last is Leave Annie, so I switch to Valkyrie. We do get hit by another Strugil Bugil here, which is pretty annoying, because it means that an Air Cutter doesn't get the one shot. So Leave Annie gets off a String Shot, but that ends up being fine. Even with the Swarm Boost, a second Strugil Bugil doesn't do that much to Valkyrie, and then August finishes off the Leave Annie, winning us the third Gym Badge. I decide to take a page out of Berg's book, and our wrapped potato evolves into a Levani of my own. I also head to Desert Resort and catch a Dwebble. I name her The Thing. In Relic Castle, I catch a Yamask and name him Uncle Ben. While I'm there, I also get the Cover Fossil and then head back to Necreen City to revive it into a Tirtuga, who I name Namor. All of a sudden, we now have a bunch of team members vying for six party slots. Sadly, Cap and Black Widow will quickly become pretty irrelevant, but they had a good run. Once I get to Nimbasa City, I can get even more team members. But first, I accidentally get roped into playing dress up with Bianca. So I dress Cap up like a 12 year old from the 2000s that unironically calls women Milady, and then I move on. From the routes around Nimbasa City, I catch a disturbing little baby thing named Vision from Route 16, some sentient garbage named Star Lord from Route 5, and a prankster Cottony named Sylvie from Lost Lorn Forest. It takes me a little while to realize that Cottony is actually a banned encounter but I don't end up using her before I realize that anyways. 
Now, it's time for the most intimate moment in the 25 plus year long history of Pokemon. The Ferris wheel ride with Trainer N. It's really impossible not to be swept up by this moment. As our carriage slowly ascends into the air, amidst the clouds, the silence between us is deafening. Until N suddenly breaks the tension and tells me his dirty little secret. He tells me he's the king of Team Plasma, and I can't believe it. N is a king. I am but a lowly commoner, and yet he trusts me. With his deepest secrets, he trusts me. It feels good knowing that someone wants to confide in me, a king no less. The air feels different up here, and it's not just from the altitude. We are now forever tied by this knowledge. I know him, he knows me. We may be two beings, but atop this metallic feat of engineering, inches apart, we feel as one. When we leave this Ferris wheel, our lives will return to normal. We will be rivals once more. But for now, N is me, I am N, and it is perfect. Okay, time for Elisa. She leads with Emolja, and I lead with Namor. This baits Elisa into using Volt Switch as I bring in Nebula, who has evolved into a Zeb Strike Gun. Volt Switch activates Nebula's Lightning Rod ability, giving her a special attack boost. Sucker. Emolja then goes for a quick attack on the next turn before I retaliate with a massive shockwave. Then Elisa completely just copies me and hard switches to her own Zeb Strika, who I then give a special attack boost to as well. Which is not great. From here, I just trade off quick attacks and rock smashes. I get a bit lucky and the 50% chance defense drop happens enough times for Nebula to finish off Zeb Strika before she can take us out. In hindsight, I should have just taught Nebula Return, which I can get from the Nimbasa Pokemon Center. It's been a while since I've played these games, so my knowledge is a little bit shaky. Now, even though we managed to beat Zebstrika, Elisa brings in her second Emolja, who knows Pursuit. So it's looking likely that Nebula goes down here. Pursuit will likely kill if I switch, but I can't really stay in because quick attacks from this Emolja and the first one that's still alive will be more than enough damage to finish me off. I kinda gotta just hope that Elisa doesn't go for Pursuit. So, I switch to War Machine. And Nebula actually survives a Pursuit. Nice! Good job, little pony. From here, War Machine finishes off Elisa's two chipmunks with some secret powers as they just continue to go for Pursuit for some reason. Must be some silly AI thing, but I'm not complaining. That's Elisa defeated and the fourth gym badge obtained. Okay, so remember how I caught Cottony from Lost Lorn Forest? Well, after evolving her into Whimsicott, I double checked the encounter list and realized that Whimsicott is not an eligible encounter, so I release her. Silver lining, I do get to go back to Lost Lorn Forest and catch an Emolja, who I named Thor, God of Hammers. I also catch a Ducklet on the Driftvale Drawbridge and name her Pepper. Ducklet and Swanna are pretty cool Pokemon. There have been quite a few water flying types already, so it was really ambitious of Game Freak in Generation 5 to say, what if we made a water flying type that was completely terrible in every conceivable way? So brave. I also head to the cold storage and catch a Vanillite, which is literally just an ice cream cone with a phase. This is peak bare minimum effort from the Pokemon company, but it is a pretty good Pokemon, so welcome to the team, Miss Marvel. On the other side of Driftvale City on Route 6, I catch a Deerling and name him Happy. I feel like I have to balance out the negativity of those last two encounters and say that I actually really like the designs of Deerling and Sawsbuck. So now it's time to take on Clay and his scary Exedrill. He leads with Krokorok, so I lead with Pepper. Krokorok goes for a Swagger, which confuses Pepper, but she manages to break through the confusion and hit Krokorok with a Feather Dance. Then I switch to Happy, who shrugs off a Crunch, though we do get the defense drop, which is a bit annoying. I stay in though to hit a Leech Seed as Krokorok goes for a Swagger. Then I switch to War Machine as Krokorok goes for a Bulldoze. From here, I try to start setting up workup boosts. I need to get about plus 4 attack to guarantee a kill with Dig on the Exedrill in the back. I have a Personberry equipped, so I stall some turns until Krokorok hits me with a Swagger to give me a free plus 2 to my attack. Unfortunately, Krokorok goes for another Swagger, and though we do break through the confusion and finish him off with a secret power, the confusion at plus 4 is ultimately pretty unideal, since hitting ourselves would now do a ton of damage. So, when Palpitoad comes out, I switch to Pepper. Palpitoad sets up an Aqua Ring, which is pretty nice for reasons that you'll see in a second. Pepper also hits Palpitoad with a Feather Dance. Then I switch to Happy, who takes a bit of damage from Muddy Water. Then we set up a Leech Seed. Then it's back to War Machine to try and start setting up workups again. The issue with this is that Muddy Water actually does a decent amount of damage, and it can lower War Machine's accuracy. If War Machine misses an attack on the Exedrill when he comes in, that would be pretty catastrophic. 
So anytime Palpitoad's muddy water lowers War Machine's accuracy, I have to switch out and start over. Again, Regenerator is doing wonders here. The other issue is that we obviously do not outspeed Exadrill with War Machine, so I need to be at relatively high health so that Exadrill doesn't crit War Machine with a bulldoze before he can attack. So I ultimately have to stall Palpitoad out of Muddy Water PP. Thankfully, because of Aqua Ring, Leech Seed takes a long time to drain Palpitoad's HP, so I do get a few chances. Clay also heals twice. So after many, many turns and a lot of switching, I eventually get War Machine into a position where he can kill Palpitoad and be at high enough HP that he's not at risk to a crit bulldoze. So Extra Drill comes in, and then he just goes for a Hone Claws. Thankfully, my calcs are correct, and War Machine does indeed one-shot Extra Drill with a dig, winning us a very weird fifth gym badge. Our roster continues to grow as we make our way to Mistralton City. I catch a clink from Chargestone Cave, and I name them Iron Man. I kind of hate this Pokemon, but they will actually be super useful since Steel types are pretty busted before Generation 6. I also catch a Super Spreader from Route 7 named Moonstar, and an Elgium from Celestial Tower named Yondu. I wish I could say that I used the least voted for Pokemon and he turned out to be an absolute beast, but no, he, he just sits in the box. So okay, it's time to fight the 6th Gym Leader Skyla, and her gym puzzle is some real Looney Tune type sh**. I straight up get launched out of a cannon and smack face first into a steel wall. That 100% kills me. But whatever, the fight with Skyla is not difficult. Even though a few of our teammates have evolved, this is just a one woman show. Nebula sparks her way through Skyla's entire team. Her Unfezant, or Unfezant, or Unfeza, I, I don't know, her bird, does tank a spark and gets off a leer. So a quick attack actually does a huge chunk of damage. But then her other two chickens are outsped and killed with a spark apiece, winning us the easiest gym badge so far. From here, we have to head into Twist Mountain. There is, of course, another rival fight with Charon right before we enter, but as always, his Pokémon are lower than the level cap of the previous gym leader, so we wipe the floor with him. However, Twist Mountain is home to one of the most surprising challenges in the game, a non-stop barrage of hikers, backpackers, and miners that all seem to have Bulldor and Girder. These two Pokemon are absolutely deadly to face in Nuzlocke's. Boulder have the ability Sturdy, so it's very difficult to take them out in one shot, and they can threaten with surprisingly strong moves like base 125 power Rock Blast. Even Rog and Rolla can be scary since they learn Rock Blast at level 14. That's insane power for such a low level. I mean, granted they have to get the five hits off, but you sort of have to play around that chance no matter how unlikely. Girder, on the other hand, is fairly bulky and almost always carries a fighting type move and rock slide. Very few Pokemon resist both those types, so they can be pretty tricky too, especially if one gets off a bulk up on the switch. As you can see, most of my Pokemon are weak to either fighting or rock, so especially in this playthrough, Girder are very scary. I've had many black and white Nuzlocke's where a Bulldor or a Girder has managed to take out one of my Pokemon. It doesn't happen here, but there are a few close calls. So this is just a PSA that if you're planning on doing a black and white Nuzlocke, be sure to have counters for these two Pokemon. Anyways, once we clear through Twist Mountain, we arrive in Isiris City. There I catch a Stun Fist named Meek that I will never use, unfortunately. I also head to the grass outside of Dragon Spiral Tower and catch a Drudagon, which has a brave nature and the ability Sheer Force. I can't believe you guys let me keep this Duplo monstrosity. Welcome to the team, Hulk. You'll be important later. After evolving a handful of my Pokémon and changing up the roster a bit, it's time to take on the 7th Gym Leader, Bryson. He leads with a Vanillish, and I lead with Iron Man, who has evolved into Clank. With an Eviolite, Iron Man doesn't take much damage from Vanillish's Frost Breath, which always crits. Then a Gear Grind knocks out Vanillish in one shot. Or I guess two shots. Beartick is out next. He starts with a Swagger, and Iron Man unfortunately hits themselves in confusion. So I switch out to Miss Marvel, who has evolved into a Vanillish of our own. She tanks an Icicle Crash on the switch. I then fire off an Icy Wind to slow Beartick down and get hit by a Slash. Then it's back to Iron Man, who shrugs off a second Slash. Now that we outspeed, we hit a strong Gear Grind, which brings Beartick into the red as he goes for Brine. Bryson then heals, and we thankfully connect with another Gear Grind. This brings Beartick into the yellow, so in order to avoid missing with another Gear Grind, Iron Man finishes off Beartick with a Flash Cannon. Briagonal is last, but after tanking a pretty soft Aurora Beam, we hit another Gear Grind, which shatters the physically frail Cryagonal, winning us the battle and the 7th Gym Badge. With that, we're in the endgame, and the story of Black and White starts to take center stage. 
Rival 3 has managed to awaken one of the ancient Unova dragons, so we have to seek help from the Dragon Master, Drayden, who also happens to be the 8th gym leader. Another word of caution here, the trainers in Drayden's gym are incredibly strong. Arguably harder than Drayden for reasons that I'll explain in a second. So be sure to have a plan for taking them out quickly before they Dragon Dance sweep your entire team. After another slight roster change, it's time for Drayden. Now, Drayden is close to being really terrifying. Two of his Pokémon have Dragon Dance, one of them being Haxorus, which is one of the strongest Pokémon in the game. The issue is that all three of his Pokémon know Dragon Tail as their only stab move, which is a move that always goes last. So even if his Pokémon set up with attack and speed boosts from Dragon Dance, they will often just go last anyways, making them a lot less scary than if they had Dragon Claw, for example, which is what the gym trainers in Drayden's gym have. In our battle, Drayden doesn't even get off a single attack, because I set up Hail with Miss Marvel, and then just sweep his team with blizzards as he greedily goes for dragon dances. So it ends up being a pretty easy battle for the 8th and final gym badge. As I make my way to the Pokemon League, it dawns on me that there is a very real possibility that I can do this challenge deathless. However, the challenge up until this point has been fairly easy. Sure, there were a few tough fights, but even with half the dex band, there's enough variety in the Pokemon that I have access to that I was able to build teams to counter pretty much every major obstacle. But the Black and White Elite Four is easily the hardest part of the game. Not so much because of the Elite Four themselves, but because instead of a champion fight, you have to do back-to-back -back fights against N and Getsis, who each have very strong teams that are several levels over the level cap of the Elite Four. So, if I want to do this deathless, I have to think pretty carefully on which six Pokémon I want to bring. I haven't spent this long planning out a team for the Elite Four in quite some time. I make sure to backtrack all over the map and pick up any items I need. At one point, I think about bringing Namor the Caracosta, and I decide to get the HM for Waterfall, which is randomly stored away on Route 18. Very bizarre. I end up not using Namor, but when looking through Route 18, I discover that I can catch a throw there. It takes forever because he can only be found in Rustling Grass and only has a 5% encounter rate, but I do eventually find the throw, catch him, and name him Red Skull. So this gets us to our final team, final having an asterisk, which I'll explain in a second. Many of these Pokémon up until this point have been completely absent from the playthrough. But here's the team that I've assembled, leveled up to the level cap of 50 to match the strongest Pokémon of each of the Elite Four members. I've also decided to edge them close to level 51 so that they can gain a few levels throughout the Elite Four, since Getsis has a level 54 Hydreigon. So, let's see if this team has what it takes to finish the run strong. First up is Caitlyn, who is a little bit harder in Black and White than she is in Black 2 and White 2 because she leads with Reuniclus instead of her useless Musharna. However, you suckers didn't ban Crustle, who is a filthy Pokémon with access to Shell Smash. Since the thing has the ability Sturdy, it is always safe to get off a Shell Smash here, which boosts our attack, special attack, and speed at the expense of defense and special defense. So after that, X Scissors and Smackdown one-shot all of Caitlyn's Pokémon. I did have to give the thing a few speed EVs to make sure that she outspeeds Sigalyph, even after the plus 2 speed boost from Shell Smash, but other than that, this is all super straightforward, and we win our first Elite Four fight. Second is Marshall, who is usually the hardest of the Elite Four members since all of his Pokémon are fairly bulky and can hit really hard. But you suckers also didn't ban the Hot Topic manager, so she just psychics her way through Marshall's entire team. Admittedly, I did need a crapload of speed EVs to outspeed Mianxiao here, and even then, it only works because Marshall's Mianxiao has a minus speed nature. Sock is a bit challenging because of Sturdy, so we can't get the one shot. I start with a Protect so that Sock can't get the boosted critical hit Retaliate, but after that, it's safe to just attack with Psychic, because even crits from Sock's moves can't one shot Vision. After Marshall wastes some Hyper Potions, Sock falls. And then Marshall's Steroidal Clown also falls to a single Psychic, winning us the second Elite Four fight. Third is Grimsley. He leads with Scrafty, and I lead with the most recent addition to the squad, Red Skull. I set up a bulk up as Scrafty goes for a Sand Attack. That would be annoying if I didn't have Vital Throw, which always goes last, but also never misses. So I do have to take another Sand Attack, but then Scrafty goes down. Lyapard comes out second. She fires off a fake out for some chip, and since we are guts instead of inner focus, Red Skull does flinch. Lyapard then uses an attract, so Red Skull is too infatuated to get off a vital throw. Red Skull, it's a cat. Calm down. Lyapard then fires off an aerial ace, proving that without fail, critical hits from Lyapard are inevitable. 
Fortunately, Red Skull comes to his senses and kills Leopard with a vital throw. Next is Bisharp, which also knows Aerial Ace, so it's not safe to stay in. I switched to Clank, who I actually decided not to evolve into Kling Clang, specifically so that I could get the Eviolite boost. Then we just start trading off attacks. Thunderbolt isn't doing as much as I would have hoped, and after a while it's clear that we're one critical hit away from being in trouble, because Grimsley will definitely heal here. So when Grimsley heals, I decide to go for a charge beam, hoping to get a special attack boost. Which I do. So this lets me easily finish off the Bisharp with two more Thunderbolts, before Bisharp manages to take us out with some Night Slashes. Last is Crocodile, so I switch to Happy on an Earthquake, who kinda sorta tanks it. But then he outspeeds Crook and takes her out with a single Horn Leech, winning us the battle. Last is Chantel. I saved this one for last because it's the one that could most likely go poorly. She leads with Kofagrigus, so it's fairly safe to get off a Shell Smash with the Thing as she just goes for a Will-O-Wisp for the burn, which gets cured by a Held Rossberry. The scary thing here though is that even at level 52, the Thing only has a 68-ish percent chance of one-shotting Kofagrigus with Shadow Claw. If she doesn't, Kofagrigus can then burn the Thing, or even threaten a kill with a critical hit since once we hit the Kofagrigus, our ability will actually change from Sturdy into Mummy. Fortunately, Shadow Claw does kill the Kofagrigus, so this fight ends up being a super easy sweep, since all of her other Pokémon are far less defensive than Kofagrigus. It's actually also surprising that neither Jellyfin's Curse Body nor Chandelure's Flame Body activated here, which would have made things a little more difficult. But I do think that our other Pokémon were more than capable of handling Chantel if needed. This just cut some time out. So with that, the Elite Four is defeated. This now leads to the ultimate showdown against N and Team Plasma. After some arguing, N reveals that Team Plasma has a secret underground castle built right behind the Pokemon League. This is about as probable as Emperor Palpatine having an entire Sith army on a hidden planet in the ninth Star Wars movie. I've got some serious questions about who built this castle and how it was just sitting underground for presumably 20 years, but it ultimately doesn't really matter because this scene is cool as hell. In fact, the idea to make the climactic end of the story act as the final battle of the game is really awesome and I'm kind of surprised that it doesn't happen more. It makes nuzlocking the game pretty annoying, but it certainly does make for a very hyped ending. Upon entering End's castle, the Team Plasma geezers try to gang up on me, and it seems like we're in for a pretty tough 6v1. But just before all seems lost, all the Unova gym leaders team up to save the day. Well, all of them except Chili, Cress, and Zillin. Those three brothers seem to be mysteriously absent. Pretty suspicious if you ask me. Anyways, with the Seven Sages distracted, I can make my way to N. Oh, whoops. Wrong way. Ignore me guys, you're doing great. On the second floor, I'm escorted by one of the three brothers from the Shadow Triad. Hmm. Three mysterious masked brothers, huh? Quite a coinkydink if you ask me. Anyways, after healing my Pokémon, I can get to the third floor where I can access the PC. This lets me actually switch my Pokémon for the final fights of the game if I want to, hence the asterisk on the final team. Vision is almost completely useless for these next two fights, so I decide to replace him with Uncle Ben. Everyone else stays though. Thanks for the help, Vision. Rest well. That finally gets us to the fight with N. Well, actually I do have to catch Reshiram first, but I just lob a Master Ball at them and dump them in the box. So now it's time to fight against N. He leads with Zekrom and I lead with Hulk in his debut battle. Zekrom doesn't know any dragon moves, so they just fire off a fusion bolt for a bit of damage as Hulk retaliates with a dragon claw, which should be a two shot. Or a one shot if he crits. Nice debut, buddy. N brings in his double scoop ice cream, so I switch to Iron Man. They tank a blizzard fairly well thanks to Eviolite. Vanillix then sets up hail as we hit a hard flash cannon. Vanillix then heals a bit of health thanks to his ice body, and then he goes for frost breath instead of blizzard for some reason. So, a Flash Cannon finishes off Vanillix, and Iron Man is still sitting at about half health. And then brings in Kling Kling, which makes no sense. But then I realize that I'm being duped. This is definitely a sneaky little Zorark who will be going for Focus Blast or Flamethrower. So I bring in Red Skull, who does indeed get hit by Zorark's Focus Blast. Zorark then goes for another Focus Blast, which actually misses. This means that my revenge is not double the power, so Zorark manages to hang on with a sliver, but then the hail that ends that up with his ice cream manages to take out Zorar. Sucks to suck, pal. This brings in the real Kling Kling, please stand up. That also doesn't really make sense, but whatever. I stay in, tank a flash cannon, which actually manages to crit, and then hit Kling Kling with a bulldoze to lower their speed. 
I then outspeed and finish them off with a storm throw that always crits. Fifth is Archeops, which is pretty scary. I switch to Iron Man and tank a hard acrobatics. I kinda need to dodge a critical hit acrobatics here, but Archeops just goes for Stone Edge, so Iron Man hits a flash cannon, which brings Archeops into the red and activates his defeatist ability. A high roll crit acrobatics will still kill Iron Man here, but I just stay in as N heals. So a flash cannon brings him into the red, and then we're in the same position. Archeops then just goes for Stone Edge again for some reason, which misses, so Iron Man survives, and Archeops goes down to another flash cannon. Last is Caracosta. This is actually still scary because Caracosta has Sturdy, so we can't one-shot him, and a crit from Stone Edge will kill Happy even from full HP. So it's not actually safe to go to our grass type, even though Caracosta is four times weak to grass type attacks. So instead, I switch to Uncle Ben. Now, I wish I could say that what I did here was on purpose, but it wasn't. When Uncle Ben comes in though, Caracosta hits him with a waterfall. This activates Uncle Ben's mummy, changing Caracosta's ability from sturdy to mummy. This means that I can now switch to happy on a crunch, and then kill Caracosta with one shot using Horn Leech since he no longer has sturdy. You'd think that that play would have been intentional since literally the exact same thing happened to my Crustal against Chantel's Kofagrigus, but no. Could have been cool to play it off as a big brain play, but that would have been dishonest. I just got lucky. Anyways, that's undefeated, and we remain deathless. But last is the fight against Getsis, and this dude is one scary son of a gun. He has a very well-rounded team, including a powerful level 54 Hydreigon. He leads with a Kofagrigus though, and since I have no break between the N and Getsis fight, I have to lead with Hulk. I immediately switch to Iron Man, expecting a Toxic, but instead I get hit by a Shadow Ball, which lowers my special defense. That's pretty unideal. But in order to save the world from me complaining about mildly bad RNG, RNG Jesus does me a solid, and our first flash cannon also gets a special defense drop on the Kofagrigus. Eye for an eye. So after that, we just trade off flash cannons and shadow balls until Kofagrigus falls. Getsis does use a full restore at some point, so we end up taking a decent amount of damage before it's all said and done. Getsis then immediately brings out his ace Hydreigon. He's going for either Focus Blast or Fire Blast. Either way, I can only bring in one of two Pokemon. I decide to go with Red Skull. Hydreigon hits a hard Fire Blast, which thankfully neither crits nor burns. Though I guess burn actually wouldn't have been that bad since we have Guts. But now I need to dodge a critical hit. If Hydreigon crits here with Dragon Pulse, the Deathless Streak ends, and we could potentially even wipe. So I hold my breath as Hydreigon fires off a nasty Dragon Pulse right into Red Skull. But he does not get the crit. That lets Red Skull hit a massive revenge, which knocks out Hydreigon in one shot. This now brings out Bufalant, who will likely go for Head Smash, so I bring in Uncle Ben. Bufalant then hits a Wild Charge, and of course Uncle Ben misses a Will-O-Wisp, but it's fine. Bufalant goes for a weak Earthquake, and then we manage to connect with a Will-O-Wisp. Now I wasn't planning on doing it this way, but when an opportunity presents itself, you kinda gotta take it. I switch to the Thing. Bufalant is doing basically no damage. This lets me set up not one, but two Shell Smashes with the Thing. So from there, it's clobberin' time. Getsus' Bufalant and his three remaining Pokemon are hacked to itty bitty little pieces by my ultra fast, ultra powerful little bug. Electros is the last to fall, so with one final X Scissor, we win the battle and the run. Well, with that, the second Snaplock has been completed. Thank you to everybody who took the time to fill out the poll. This was a really fun challenge, and I got to use a lot of cool Pokemon. Plus, it marks, I think, the first hardcore Nuzlocke video that I managed to do completely deathless. Hopefully it was still a fun one to watch. If you like the idea of the Snaplock, let me know by liking the video and commenting. It really helps me determine what people are interested in seeing. And if you do like these Snaplocks, let me know what you want to see for Snaplock number three. Oh, and be sure to subscribe to the channel. Or don't. I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges, and subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. You can also join the Flag on HG community Discord where you can discuss Nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.